Media. Le monde, c'est nous. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello, beautiful people of Africa and of the world at large. Welcome uh, to yet another edition of the uh, program Views on uh, the uh, Continent on the Pan African Television. We have come again to discuss uh, what is happening across the African continent, looking at how uh, the uh, changes that have occurred in the uh, global world actually affecting uh, governance in Africa. And we're here to ask the question on how. African governments can reshape their governance system to meet, of course, uh, the changing uh, uh, politics at uh, the international arena. This is views on the continent. And of course, uh, we start by asking uh, this question. Uh, where does Africa stand in attaining good governance and democratic institutions? According to a report, uh, which was released in 2019 by uh, the uh, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, African governments Governments recorded enormous strides in ensuring uh, governance, especially uh, around uh, socio-economic development, uh, though the report highlighted uh, that aspects like democracy and uh, political governance uh, uh, performed law, economic development, management, and uh, corporate uh, governance, according to the report, uh, equally uh, witnessed uh, some gains. Uh, now, uh, uh, the question is, uh, uh, or however, this question has, has again come to uh, the limelight or to the fore, as uh, major changes in the world have redefined uh, global politics or international politics, which have uh, a direct or indirect uh, uh, impact on the, the government system uh, not just uh, uh, around the world but particularly in Africa and we are still asking the questions uh, how does the African continent position uh, its server uh, at the international air arena and uh, what form of governance suits the present content uh, context that would ensure uh, accountability transparency uh, responsiveness the role of law enclosure stability equity and uh, uh, inclusiveness, empowerment, and of course, broad based participation, all this uh, lie around uh, the governance uh, structure or system. And uh, that is what we are discussing this day on the program Views on the Continent. For uh, one hour, we're going to analyze uh, uh, what governance is, uh, the governance system in Africa, and of course, to see if there is need for the continent to reshape or to redefine its governance system, given the changes which have occurred at uh, the uh, uh, international arena. And of course, uh, uh, without uh, wasting time, uh, I'll be glad to introduce to you uh, the panel that will give more insight or analysis on this very important topic based on governance and we know that good governance of course will promote development will of course be uh, a way towards solving the problems or crisis uh, affecting countries across Africa and today we are going to South Africa uh, to meet uh, Mr. Good News uh, uh, Kadogan he's a Pan-African leadership coach hello to you sir and thanks for joining us this day taking this opportunity to wish you a happy new year 2023 and welcome good day uh, Clarice and uh, to my fellow panelist Francis and to the listeners across the world I feel great to be here 
Dida. It is great to be with you again to discuss this very important uh, topic of uh, governance in Africa and how the African governments can reshape their governance to meet the changing times. In uh, going now to Nigeria, we are meeting Mr. Francis Umendiego. He's a governance policy researcher and project management expert. Hello to you, sir. Thanks for joining joining us this day and wishing you, to you a happy new year 2023 thank you for having me i'm very happy to be part of this um, um robust discussion thank you viewers thank you for having me and a happy new year to everyone i wish you a very good one and um, i say compliments of the season to everyone thank you you too for accepting to be with us uh, this day to continue to talk very important issues that will go a long way to transform the African continent. Diving straight away to the analysis, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Kedogan. We're talking today about Africa reshaping uh, its governance system or its governance, but then before looking at that, let's understand uh, uh, what governance is all about, bringing it uh, uh, or relating it with the, the African context. That is very good, uh, and, and I'm happy to, to take the first bite of this debate because uh, when we look at governance, it is a basket of things. Uh, it's about saying, from a government point of view, how much of what we put in as public office bearers uh, to serve the public that we represent, as opposed to serving uh, uh, foreign interests, so to speak. Because at the end of the day, it's the people that elect government. And government is supposed to actually, through the public office bearers, to serve the interests of the people. And uh, there are a few kind of categories of uh, uh, this thing that uh, we refer to as governance. And one of them is to serve uh, under the burner of environmental uh, challenges. And secondly, it's about social challenges and, and how we lead uh, in the context of geopolitics. So you find that some governments still have uh, some linkages to former uh, uh, colony, uh, colonial masters, where they're still paying uh, some kind of uh, tax or revenue or whatever it is that they pay, uh, thereby diverting uh, whatever comes out of the resources that they uh, have in the country towards their former colonial masters. And one of the biggest, biggest challenges, even bigger than that, is the fact that the colonial value chains have never been broken. So there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, getting resources from the ground on the continent and exporting these resources without actually uh, beneficiating them. So that in the end, the return on investment for the resources that have is a kind of a pittance. And not only are we uh, exporting these resources in their raw form, we are also exporting jobs that would otherwise have been on the continent had we had a longer value chain of value adding so that in the end, the young Africans who are now even at the, at, at the level of uh, more than 50% uh, in the age group of 18 to 35, uh, being unemployed. So that is uh, the kind of a basket of challenges that I believe uh, fall under this uh, thing called governance from a government point of view. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll be coming to you subsequently, uh, Mr. Kedogan, for us to continue to understand or analyze uh, the governance lapses uh, and how uh, African governments or stakeholders can ensure that uh, the reshape, you made mention of the aspect of uh, how uh, the uh, geopolitics around the world is actually affecting the governance system in Africa. I will come out with you, uh, Mr. Francis. Uh, we heard in the preamble, like uh, according to a report, the first governance uh, report uh, uh, released by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, that was in 2019, we saw some, uh, of course, of positive uh, strides recorded by African continents regarding governance, but he made mention of the fact that there is lack in democracy and political governance. And today we want to discuss further the governance structure or system in Africa as a governance expert. So what do you think uh, 
can now be done uh, at this juncture to reshape uh, the governance system or structure across Africa to meet uh, the, the challenges or the, the international, the changes or the drastic shift at the international arena regarding politics and uh, governance as a whole. Thank you. Thank you for having me once again. Um, thank you for that question. Can you hear me clearly? Unfortunately, yeah, we are having some interruptions. I'll be coming back to you, Mr. Francis. Just to remind our viewers joining us this day or this time that uh, this is uh, the program Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television. And we are analyzing governance system or structure in Africa, looking at how African governments are ready to reshape the governance system to meet uh, the uh, uh, international uh, the challenges or the changes at the international arena. If it's uh, all good with Mr. Francis, we can ride on uh, with uh, the, the question on, on how uh, African governments can, of course, uh, uh, reshape the governance system across countries in Africa. Differences and variations, but generally, there are characteristics you can see in them. You see, you see primitive accumulation of wealth by politicians using state resources. You, you also see, um, you also see weak uh, and then you see a lot. Now, going back to the report you talked about, yes, there has been there has been a, a tremendous improvement in, in 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 governance across African countries, uh, especially in areas of um um you know. Let me put it this way: globalization has made it easy. There are a lot of things that has come in in our in our governance processes you talk about budget before it wasn't so sophisticated as it is now you see people making good policies having uh, robust um, contributions and uh, policy directions that government leverage on you see literally technology coming in but then those things are not really translating to development that's the issue they are not really... okay can i continue the, those those issues are not really uh, I'm translating to development, and they are not really making the the life of the common man so enjoyable and so at ease. That those are the issues. So the, the the report is correct to say that there has been development, but then also the report noted that there are, on the issue of democratization that um, African governance processes has not been so uh, um, desirable. I agree partly with with that assertion that we have not been so much um, democratic. But then the question is, is the goal for African societies to become democratic or is the goal for African society to develop? If the goal is for us to develop, then is democracy the way for us to develop? If yes, what aspect of democracy? So I don't want us to focus so much on how, how well we have done or we have performed in trying to democratize governance process in Africa. I would rather want us to, to be focused on how has this helped the, the, the social development, the uh, socioeconomic realities and exigencies of the ordinary African person. So I will stop here for now. I hope I've answered that question, but just take, take this from me. The focus is not how well we have democratized, but how well we have the democracy or other forms of government to achieve development for our society. So I will stop here for now. Thank you. That's, that's a very good uh, problematic, of course, to reckon on. How well is it democracy or how well has the governance system ensured democracy or the development of the African continent? And of course, uh, uh, we are to look at uh, the relation between governance and development uh, in Africa. Let me come back uh, to you, uh, Mr. Kadogan. Uh, we want us to dwell while talking earlier on. You made mention about uh, uh, the, the, the present uh, geopolitics around uh, the world or across Africa that is actually uh, giving another perspective 
effective or affecting the governance system. Let's try to understand the relationship between governance and geopolitics, especially yeah, in the contemporary society, and then see how Africa, like we asked in the preamble, how can Africa position itself better at the international level to make good use of the changes that are occurring uh, to actually position itself and to ensure uh, that their stakeholders drive the development that African countries or African economies need. It's, it's, a, it's a great question to ask and to ask uh, in debate because there is a direct link between governance and geopolitics. And it links to what uh, my fellow panelists here, Francis, raised uh, as to whether uh, leadership or any form of governance actually delivers development. There's a very nice book in the development sector that was written by Amartya Sen. And uh, the title of the book is uh, Development as Freedom. So if we, we actually look at development to such an extent that uh, it doesn't uh, deliver freedom to the followers of the governments that we are putting in place, then it means then that form of governance is uh, not helpful to the people. There has to be a kind of a looking towards the people as opposed to looking away from the people to serve the colonial masters, to serve the interests of the major geopolit geopolitical powers at the expense of the people. So if the government of the day in any of the countries on the continent focuses on uh, serving the interests of the people that it represents, then we can say democracy works. But if democracy and development are not a return in investment for putting a particular government in place, then it means they are not serviceable. There has to be a direct and an intentional and a planned looking at the needs of the citizens of any particular country. And if we raise the bar a little bit and we look at Africa as a whole from Cape to Cairo, it, needs, it means then that through the African Union, through the new Africa uh, Partnership for uh, uh, Africa's development, and also the intra-Africa trade uh, platform that has been created now, if these bodies do not deliver development and do not deliver a better economic outcome for the continent as a whole, it means then there is no proper collaboration to Cairo. So it, it's not just at a national level, it goes to the regional level and it goes to the continental level, that kind of a look with the look inside as opposed to looking outside to serve the interests uh, of the colonial masters. And lastly, what I would like to say is that if you look at the World Competitiveness Report, there is a very direct link between the, 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 the intimacy that exists between government of the day, of the, of, of the top 20 uh, countries that form part of the World Competitiveness Report from a uh, economic development point of view, and the intimacy between those governments and business leadership. To such an extent that business and government work together to serve the economic interests of those countries. Whilst in, in, in Africa it's different, the business leaders of most of these, uh, the, these African countries, they serve the mothership, they serve the head office of the multinational, as opposed to serving the interests of the citizens in collaboration with the government in which they exist. That's the last point. Viewers that that is views on the continent on the Pan African Television of Freak Media. You are most welcome. You can follow us live on Facebook at Afric Media. I'll drop your comments. What do you think uh, is the state of the governance system or in Africa? And of course, does Africa have uh, strong institutions of that uh, can ensure uh, 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 development, inclusion, uh, and of course, accountability and transparency, among other things? 
questions. Uh, we continue in the same perspective with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Francis. Uh, we're looking at, at governance, and you, you ended with a problematic. And we're looking at governance to make democracy or to make development. So let's look at, at the, the level at where Africa stands in attaining uh, this good governance and, of course, democratic institutions. But, of course, let's start by actually uh, pinpointing or highlighting those factors that will characterize uh, a good government. Thank you. Thank you for um, um, that. I would come in to say that um, Africa, a continent, has the culture. We agree. Africa as a continent has begun on the path of development. We agree. Africa as a continent cannot operate in isolation without relating to countries around, around it, which now points us to the geopolitical context in which African governance operates. We agree. But what position is Africa taking? You, you, you might decide to be the market. You might decide to be the supplier of raw material. You might decide to be the producer of the goods that you have the raw material to produce. When you take all these positions, and challenges will come. Those that have been uh, uh, benefiting from your inactivities may want to fight back. How do you position yourself? So if you if you just check these four four uh, expressions I have made now, you realize that is the issue of first of all the the visionary leadership of the of the political leadership country, and then Africa as a continent when they they converge under the auspices of AU or whatever platform they have. So the, the point is, Africa cannot expect that it will develop in isolation. The development Africa will attain will come from its interaction with the realities within and the realities that are external to its existence. Then, in the sense that they will check the human capacity available to them. They will check the raw materials available to them. They will check the areas of thread where they have comparative advantages that they explore to, to, to reach their potential. So that's, with, that's part of the things within. Now, externally, you don't just go to become friends with anybody because they were friends of your father. You, you, you decide whether your friendship with this person speaks good to the vision in now brings the problem, what if there is no vision? So the international relations and the foreign policy of African nations will be unguarded, directionless, and fruitless to its people. But then, if there is a vision, when, when Africa wakes up in the morning like a man going into the market or anything, every other activity, who they greet, who they don't greet, who they decide to associate with, the policies they adopt, the, the wars they fight, or the ones they don't fight will be decided by the role that that decision or action will play in the pursuit of the vision for development they have for their people. So from this letter I've said now, the most important thing is Africa must develop visionary leadership. Where it is existing, it must be sustained and protected. Where it is not existing, the people must fight to make sure that they have visionary political leadership. That's one. Secondly, institutionalization. My, my good friend made mention of uh, when, uh, before now, when the state was meant to protect certain people and, and not serve the, uh, the general masses. Let me give you an instance. Now, we are talking governance and we are talking development, right? We are talking democracy. We are not really talking security. But you know that security is an integral part of what we are discussing. Because before now, the states in Africa, we are actually tools to, to, to let's say, protect regimes, to protect the state. So you are talking about state security. Whenever you mention security, it is, met, it is mentioned in the context of state regime, protecting the regime, state security. But now the discussion has moved away from that. We are now talking about human security. So it's no longer about the state. It is about the human people. So my, my point is this. My point is this. We must, first of all, know where we are standing before we start running. If we don't know where we are standing, it will be very difficult to measure how far we have run or how far we have run in governance, in security, in democratic consolidation, in deepening the tenets of democracy in our society, in improving our institutions. You must know where you are standing first. Africa has... Africa media. currently, 
and they are making developmental policies, who will implement them? In what environment will these policies be implemented? You, 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 you get my point. In what environment, in what context are these policies implemented? So let me, let me, let me point out this. If I still have some minutes, let me point out this. It is high time. It is high time that Africa begin to uh, take strategic, coordinated, and deliberate steps. Begin to take deliberate steps towards the attainment of East East development. I'm not against democracy. I'm a Democrat, full, full Democrat. But you might have question with my definition of democracy if I give it. You know why? Because you might not see some ingredients in the definition I may give, and you may not like, it, or you may also like it. But the summary is this: whatever mode of governance, whatever system of governance we are adopting, whatever uh, a pattern of administration that we are adopting, we must first of all understand the peculiarities of the African from African society, the African nations, the reality of our people. Then we now situate that with what we are pursuing, the developmental goals we are pursuing. Everybody has keyed into the sustainable development goals. And I'm a, if you watch, I even have the, the lapel here. I'm a strong advocate of that. But my, my point is this. Do not measure that general global statistics without putting in consideration the local context in which where they are being pursued. For instance, I have, uh, uh, let's say, if I have war in my country, my developmental space uh, uh, pace might be different from a country where there is stability. So in, in such context, I will not be looking at uh, ensuring that everywhere is democratic, for instance. I will be ensuring it, that we have security of human beings, human lives and property. Then I'll be talking about food security because those are the basics. I may not join you. I may not join you, you that is developed. I may not join you to be shouting climate change. I may be interested, first of all, in making sure that there is food security, that my people can go to farm, that my people can, can walk about freely and do their businesses without fear of intimidation. You, you get the, the angle I'm going. So the developmental priorities of societies should be decided by the visionary leadership of their political class. We should then be informed by the, by the necessary needs of the people. So Africa should be very deliberate, very, very deliberate in deciding the policies they pursue in the effort to attempt development. I mean, strong Democrats, and I will keep saying it, but as you are practicing that democracy, do what we call soul searching. Find out what your society needs as an African society. Find out what the needs of your people are. Then develop policies that will help you to uh, 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 solve those problems not just developing policy. Let me start, let me end with this. You must develop institutions that will be the structure to carry those policies. If you make good policies, and for instance, there is no there is no co co continuity in governance, the policies are, 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 are wasted. If you make good policies, and then resources are budgeted to go and, uh, for instance, build roads, build factories, so that you can connect the farm to the market, so that people can. Uh, uh, cultivate raw material, uh, uh, agric agricultural materials, bring them to the market, sell, and then they, they, that makes food available, and then that brings down the cost of living for people and all that, and people earn money. Good intention, good policy, but then you, you budget money for it, and you do not follow it up, and the money is embezzled. The money is embezzled, but everybody claps for you because your budget is, is development-oriented. But then the implementation is a mess. So as you are putting good policies, ensure that you are strengthening the institutions, whether by making laws that back them or whatever good process that you will employ to ensure that. So my summary is this. Africa is not operating in isolation. Africa is operating in the context of its, its relationship with internal and external variables. Now, in that, as they are relating and operating in that uh, uh, context, their pursuit for development should be guided by having people-oriented uh, uh, policies, governance policies, and then putting in structures and strengthening the institutions to ensure that these policies actually translate to realities of development and good governance for the people. Let me stop with this. Thank you. For, I, I will still be here to take more of your questions. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, which is very important.
imperative uh, what you just uh, highlighted, uh, Mr. Francis. Uh, we are going to continue. You you made mention uh, uh, about democracy, democratic institutions, uh, Mr. Cadogan. Uh, I will continue in the same light. We are looking at uh, governance here, and uh, we know that some of the problems uh, affected uh, affecting the African continent is due to the uh, governance lapses, which have been uh, noticed or highlighted across Africa. So today we want to look at, do you think uh, uh, democracy is the only system or uh, 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 a valuable form of governance uh, uh, that can bring sustainability? And of course, let's look at uh, uh, the, the political will and the sustenance of good governance across Africa. Good news, Kadogan. Yes, thank you very much, um, Clarice. Uh, most leaders that you find on the continent that get involved in the lapses of uh, governance, it is mainly because of a self-serving attitude. They haven't yet reached the point whereby they go into leadership to serve the people that put them there. And because of this self-serving attitude, they then tend not to build institutions that will call them to order when they decide, uh, contrary to the intention uh, of why they have been put in public office. So it is very important to ensure that uh, the institutions of governance are strengthened beyond the current holders of public office. By doing that, you then prevent uh, the, the occurrence of lapses of governance because they are things that have been put in place, measures put in place to ensure that it becomes difficult when a self-serving person gets into a leadership position. So by strengthening these institutions, you then make or reduce the incidence of uh, lapses in governance. That's what I can say for now. You talked about creating uh, strong institutions. There's, there's one issue that is affecting, of course, uh, 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 countries across Africa. You see uh, that the citizens, the, the, the few uh, dissociated from uh, from the government, whereas uh, uh, the existing uh, form of governance uh, uh, warrants a total enclosure. So in your own perspective as a Pan-African leadership coach, what do you think stakeholders or governments can do to to, to uh, ensure total uh, enclosure of the citizens eh? and, of course, see them participate in uh, the, uh, maybe indirectly in the decision making of uh, the uh, uh, countries eh? and, of course, ensuring uh, that these uh, policies uh, are actually well implemented, that we see that the results in development and, of course, uh, the, the living standards of the population. Yes, so, so there I would mention two things. One is know-how. If the citizens do not have the know-how of influencing the governments, then it becomes difficult. And the know-how for the citizens comes from two places. Cognitive ability, them being able to process what is coming at them so that they can make good decisions. It is also about their level of development and orientation that allows them to be able to stick to the original purpose of why governance is an issue and, and, and the role of each of these citizens. The second part uh, outside know-how is the discipline. If the citizens, uh, like for example, I can use South Africa. Uh, when South Africa moved from the apartheid system into uh, the freedom that was attained in 1994, Many of the activists and people who actually worked very hard to create uh, the post-apartheid system, they then gave uh, all the responsibility to political leadership to actually carry on with creating those institutions. And as a result, the lapses in governance in the last 30 years in South Africa have increased. And also the institutions that are supposed to keep uh, government leaders in place have been weakened over time. And all of that is as a result of the general population and citizens that are supposed to drive democracy, not knowing how to do it, not having the discipline to do it, but also on the same time, uh, and not being uh, geared towards co-governance with their leaders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kadogan.
again. Uh, we're going to continue, Mr. Francis. Uh, we know the, the African Union has uh, actually defined a good development agenda for the continent Africa. We are talking about the uh, agenda 2063 and of course we cannot also relegate the uh, united nations uh, sustainable development goals uh, and of course agenda 2030 but you know real development will only uh, come or can only be seen if uh, the, 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 there is strong uh, uh, practical governance that will ensure uh, the uh, uh, development of economics so what do you think or why do you think uh, africa will stand maybe in the nearest future in terms of governance uh, and of course how it can inculcate uh, the dictates of the Af uh, uh, agenda 2063 and use its governance system to ensure this practical uh, development that will solve the, the many problems faced by the continent the solution thank you for the question the solution is policy 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 the agendas by the UN is good. The agenda as uh, um, uh, 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 propounded and uh, uh, agreed upon by the African Union is good. How do you domesticate the realities of those of those uh, uh, visions? Vision 2063, Vision uh, 2030. They have pillars, they have goals in these visions, right? How do you domesticate them? Government will have to align their day-to-day -day governance processes towards the attainment of the goals that these bodies have achieved. Having said that, let me give you a little background that will help us understand this. Africa started well, especially after the, uh, most of the African countries got their independence from their SY colonial uh, um, um, masters. They, they started well, they started forming government, their people went into civil service, you know, things we are beginning to take shape and all that, until, until they had a uh, um, coup, coup d'etat, okay? By the introduction of coup d'etat into the governance process of Africa, the governance institutions we are halted, the growth in the governance institutions we are halted. Remember when we got the independence, they were not so, so, uh, um, developed they were not so full-fledged as they are as they are ought to be because they were nascent they were young okay but the introduction of the military into governance truncated that growth on the line truncated that growth process so by the time the military left and now we are back in, uh, into civilian government in most of the african countries you find out that the institutions have been bacchanized the processes the to to now have Civil servants behave like civil servants is very wrong for them. To have police behave as, as, a, as an agency that protects the citizens and provides services for the citizens, you now see them more as a force because of that mentality and hangover. Let me call it hangover from the, from the military era. Now, bringing it back to what we are saying, how can Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa and other African countries, how can they comfortably uh, um, how can they begin to domesticate and uh, to achieve these uh, uh, goals of the of the of the goals, the goals of these visions? One, for, let me use uh, uh, as the SDG and sustainable de uh, development goals. If you are talking about efforts to end hunger, to make sure that everybody has access to education, uh, quality healthcare, you are talking about safe environment, you are talking about sustainable consumption, you are talking about. Um, um, right to have um, um, right to have uh, um, uh, access to employment and all that. It is the government's day-to-day -day policy. If you 2023 budget, you make a budget. 2024, you make a budget. 2025, you make a budget. You 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 don't just wake up any morning and say, "I have achieved the sustainable development goals." No, you can achieve it by aligning the vision in those documents. To the policies and budgets that you make on a yearly basis. Then after making the budget, you ensure that you are pursuing the implementation processes of these budgets and policies you have enacted. Remember, you, uh, United Nations is hanging in the air like a federal government. AU is hanging in the air like a state government. 
But those states, those member states that have become that, that are actually the members of the of the unions of, of these platforms, they are the people that the organizations are meant for. They are the people that can give flesh and give life to these visions that these institutions have uh, have have uh, 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 propounded. So AU cannot attend its vision unless the member states of AU begin to make domesticate policies, projects, programs, initiatives that will bring to life those ingredients, those indicators, those targets that you have in the in the in the in the policy documents at the at the uh, um, uh, sub-regional levels and national and international level. So as the HSDGN is United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it has 17 goals, right? In each of those goals have indicators, have targets. So every government must make effort to find out how to how to channel how to rework its budgetary processes to ensure that they are investing more in infrastructure they are investing more in education they are investing more in health they are investing more in agricultural production they are investing more in access to capitals for people to to okay let me give you this instance a young boy leaves school there is no job for him in any civil service because everywhere is filled up. And then he 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 goes to farm. He can't go to farm because there is no security. Uh, bandits and terrorists are in the forest. He can't go to farm. Then he goes to collect loan. They say he can't collect loan because he doesn't have collateral. He must own a land or a property too. Well, can he own a land from his mother's womb? No. He needs to work to, to have that. Okay, he goes to look for a job. The few people that have uh, private persons that own jobs cannot employ him because their overhead cost is so much. They can't buy fuel. They don't have light to run computers and all that. You see the condition. So what government can do in this situation is to ensure that it provides a conducive environment for business to thrive. So people can raise one million naira or whatever currency you may want to say, and then start up a, start up a business, employ two or three persons, and they create value. So government's own now is to create the environment for private persons to drive the development. That's one. Government can decide to provide credit facilities so that people can obtain loans and then invest. That's two. Government can decide to build strategic rural urban roads that will connect the farm to the market so that when they produce uh, 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 agri agricultural products, they don't get wasted. You know those things are perishable most times. They don't get wasted in the bush. They are brought to the market and they are sold. It's government that can do that. The government cannot put money in people's pockets. The government can create the environment in which people can now engage in meaningful activities that will produce the wealth, which will be the attainment of the development we are looking for. So if my society is not safe, but I'm making so much money, do I have development? No, because I can't sleep. Because somebody can shoot me anytime and take the money, and everything is wasted. In fact, crime will become more profitable than being, being legitimate. You get the point. So government have a role to play in their day-to-day -day policies that, that they employ in their govern, go, governance processes. Once they do that, then we can begin to see trickles upon trickles. You'll see droplets of water beginning to form ocean. Let me end with this, please. Development is not a state that you attend. No person can attend development. Development is a process. You grow in it. That's why you hear words like less developed countries, more developed countries, advanced countries, because it's in comparison. If you look at this country and look at another one, you say this one is more developed. But that one that you have called developed, if you place it side by side with another one, you realize that it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't even attend a, a, a half of what the other country has done. So let's not be looking at development as something when you arrive, you're like, I have arrived. No. Development is a process. And how do you grow in that process? Policy by policy. There is need for political will, like my senior brother has said. There is need for political will for you to pursue people-oriented policies, governance policies. There is also need for political will to protect what you are doing because corruption will fight back. But finally, development is not a state, but a process. And we can only use governance policies, day-to-day -day governance policies, to ensure that our society attains a level of uh, development. Thank you.
Thank you for, for that uh, insight, uh, Mr. Francis. Uh, we come to you, Mr. Kedrogan. Uh, we are looking at uh, governance, uh, using the governance, existing governance system to solve the problems of the continent. Uh, in uh, the analysis we have mentioned, or uh, you have mentioned about corruption, accountability, and transparency, uh, things which are actually very uh, lacking uh, in Africa. And of course, uh, let, let's look look at uh, the relationship between uh, uh, governance and the fight against corruption and governance in ensuring total accountability and transparency across Africa in uh, the, the contemporary uh, society that the continent is moving uh, towards uh, uh, redefining uh, its economic trajectory given the changes uh, uh, brought by the, the, the crisis, coronavirus, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. What is the relationship between governance and the fight against corruption and ensuring total accountability and transparency? It is very direct uh, because without um, proper governance systems and institutions uh, that are strong, it becomes difficult to hold leaders accountable. Let's look at the private sector in, in brief. The private sector uh, has got uh, shareholders that own the company that then uh, uh, give the agency to lead uh, the institutions or the corporations that they set up to boards. And the board members, uh, some of whom are independent, some of whom are executive board members, they then uh, use and delegate that authority to executive management. When executive management assumes office, they know that they are held accountable by the board. And they would always do what the board wants. And if they don't, they then uh, actually uh, get removed from the positions that they find themselves in. And in some companies where the boards are weak, you'll find that uh, they really go down up to a point of being liquidated because of poor governance. If we take that model into the, pub, into, into the public sector, you have a similar kind of thing. The board that actually, uh, or the shareholders that actually put the executive management in place uh, are actually uh, uh, the public itself. The public then uh, assigns the leadership role to the public office bearers uh, who are in the political arm and also in the administrative arm, and also the judiciary as well. So all of these three, the judiciary, executive management, uh, um, they actually then hold hands and interdependently lead and make sure that governance exists. When there is a kind of a lack of independence out of the three main areas, uh, of governance in so far as the public sector is concerned, driven by the fourth arm, which is the electorate, you then find these lapses in government. Because now the leaders who assume public office are not held accountable by the public that put them in there. And the institutions that the public uh, sets up via the governance system, they also become weakened. So there is a direct link between the different parties, the leadership, the accountability partners being the public and the accountability institutions uh, that uh, uh, are anything between the administrative arm of government and the judiciary find themselves now failing to make sure that the leaders are held accountable. So as a leader, I tend to do what I want because I know no one will take me out of that position because I know that no one can hold me accountable. So it's that, it's that kind of cycle that involves and is centered, the center of gravity of the whole complex governance system is around the people, the population. That's why it's important for the population to be uh, an advanced kind of population that can actually sense and make sense of what is going on and act accordingly, both in the short term and in the long term. Because some of the things you cannot fix immediately, but you have to set up things that 
make it possible for the population through institutions to fix the problems of governance in the medium term and in the long term by setting up the right institutions and creating an, a, a system that is filled with equilibrium that makes it very difficult for any of the parties in the different parts of leadership to act in a self-serving kind of way. So that, that's that's the thing uh, that I'm, that's my position on this, yes. Tiva, a great insight uh, uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the issue of governance across uh, Africa. We are almost culminating, but we continue to uh, look at aspects uh, where uh, the, 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 the governance or uh, uh, African governance needs to actually strengthen, especially uh, in uh, the uh, uh, contemporary society with uh, uh, so much uh, economic hurdles. Uh, coming to you, uh, Mr. Francis, let as you were talking earlier about the government uh, uh, making, uh, providing a conducive or safe environment for business to thrive, I want us to dwell on uh, how governance can actually uh, promote or hasten the total implementation. It's true that some African countries have started trading under the African continental free trade area. So, do you think the existing system or form of governance will be thorough? about to fast track this uh, trade or historic trade thank you thank you for having me and um, i will have to apologize in the next um three four minutes i will be leaving because i have to chair another meeting now okay but um thank you so much for having me in response to your question let me say this while we were young i i used to have this notion that politics is different from um, economies and then you have society and then you have science and then you have security i have grown to see that it's not so you cannot divorce politics from economics that's what we call we say political economy these days that's the relationship between the market and and state power now government if government takes the lead role in trying to drive development in the sense of uh, um creating jobs employing people uh, paying people school fees as welfare package and all that, it weighs government down. It abounds in literature. Literature has, has evidence that it is not usually efficient and effective for government to take up such roles in that uh, uh, bigger proportion. However, government has a more critical role that has been proven that when government plays this particular role, development begins to happen on its own. When a father puts the house in order, everybody knows when to go and do the chores that they have to do. Things begin to work as if there is a system, right? That's the role of government. The father is not meant to go and wash plates, go and sweep the house, go and uh, when the kids are there. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do chores in the house. Please don't. This is a context. This is an analogy. But then when the father goes to the market, makes money and comes back, the mother goes to the market, makes money and comes back too. Then this person goes to this road, this person goes. You see that system. So in this understanding, government's role is not to, it's not necessarily to say, I will create 4 million jobs in my first tenure. And then in my second tenure, I will create another 4 million. That's, that's, that's a very uh, misleading assertion to make. Okay? Rather, government should rather say, I will put this law in place that will uh, uh, make it possible for you to borrow money from social so bank with little collateral and little interest. Once that law is in place, people will rush to come and collect money. If they collect money, they will go and open businesses, right? If they open businesses, young school leavers will get jobs. As they are working in that place to earn money, they are producing value. That value they are producing is exchanged in the market, whether as a good or as a service. And that's value, that's growth, right? Now, what is the role of government in that? Government provided the conducive environment for people to uh, uh, obtain loan, for instance. They, they may now strengthen the social institutions like police. So you are sure that when you are in that office working, nobody will come to kill you, right? They also make sure that the judiciary is independent so that when two of these people that are in the market begin to have issue, whether about their land, about their goods, or about any other thing, they go to the judiciary who is independent, who is also competent to adjudicate and say, according to the laws of the land, this is this, this is that. 
That is the role of government. Okay? Now, also, when you begin to talk about amenities, social amenities, like having schools, having roads, having all that, government has a role to play in those areas. But do not mistake this to be that government should now assume that mentality that government should be providing education, providing health, providing uh, uh, security, government should own all the airports, government should own seaports. No. Literature shows or research has shown us that you can partner with the private persons so that government takes a back seat, a regulatory kind of back seat, and then intervene where they need to intervene. Not necessarily taking the lead. You get the point. Not necessarily taking the lead. So whether AU, ECOWAS, EU, um, United Nations, all these agencies are not functioning in isolation. They are a conglomeration of all member states, right? And these member states are the governments we are talking about. Let me say this. I will end with this. As we are talking about national government, you know when I may say government, our mind goes to national government. Absolutely. What of the state? What of the state government? The regional government? The local government? For instance, in Nigeria, the state government and the and the local government, they get about more than forty five percent of the national board of the national allocation every month. So about forty, maybe fifty or so goes to the federal government. So when we are now focused on tracking and measuring and following how the federal government implements those resources. The governors are, are, are just using the money for whatever they want to do. And they are the people more closer to the people. The, the, the state governments are the ones closer to the people. So as you're talking about uh, corruption and accountability, I, I just laughed when I had it. Institutions, once the institutions are strong, whether you are a strong president or a weak president or a stammerer, an orator, once you have strong institutions, everybody will function. And how do you bring about strong institutions? The leadership, political leadership of a country must have that will to conceive a vision to make the lives of its people better. Once that is in place, then they should pursue policies that are people-oriented, people development-oriented. And once that is in place, now they should now provide conducive environment for people to function. If you, if you government cannot go and own farm, but they can provide subsidy for fertilizer, for instance. People will go and buy. But instead of corruption coming into that, government might decide to say, okay, we have uh, extension, uh, agricultural extension workers that will release to go and teach farmers on, on, uh, on the new and better ways of practicing agriculture so that they can produce quality uh, uh, ag agro products that they can compete in the market. Now, for instance, government might begin to build small, small factories around the farm settlements so that not when we produce tomatoes and in two months everything has perished and then we, we in time to, uh, we start looking for tomatoes. But if government have small, small industries that are not so expensive around the farm settlements, they will begin to convert those things that are coming from the farm into finished products. And they can even bring preservative methods so that in season of tomatoes and out of season of tomatoes, we have tomatoes. We have maize, we have millet, we have all those things. So it's not produced, you produce at, at $1, you sell at $1.5, it is uh, uh, processed elsewhere, brought back to you, and sold to you at $30. Remember, Africa has the biggest market. Mm -hmm. So as a government, even if you begin to produce to sell to your people, you have the market to, to do that. So we should move this, side, this mentality away from being the source of raw material and begin about industrialization. They can talk about how to utilize the resources we have both human and material resources africa is blessed and i wish africa all the very best thank you thank you and god bless you please permit me to run along i have to chair another meeting thank you okay thank you so okay. much uh, mr francis thank you, thank you for the great insight and for your time uh, on uh, uh, giving great insight on this very important topic uh, i will continue with you mr good news Kadukan. of course uh, the one last statement yes. before we go uh, looking at what uh, mr francis just underlined uh, it brings me to this aspect of relating uh, the, the 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 way of uh, we go about uh, uh, politics across africa so let's relate uh, governance and political rhetorics and see how this uh, uh, is actually helping uh, if this is actually helping to grow the economies or it is helping to to to, to bring regression uh, or, 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 or decline uh, in the economic development of countries i think the devil is in the detail
when it comes to whether democracy works. Um, if you put democracy in place without accountability and accountability institutions, then you will not have the required gain in actually ensuring that there is economic development. And therefore then, the ordinary person on the continent in any country will not feel the gain. But if you were to make sure that there is a balance of powers uh, between those who exercise leadership and those who hold them accountable, surely anywhere in the world that system works, irrespective of whether you're in Africa, in Europe, or in America. Accountability is key. Of course, how I was like, just answer this short one, like, how can we uh, fix or redefine the politics? Because, like, Mr. Francis underlined, the economy, the, 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 the uh, education, everything is linked to uh, the policies that are being made uh, by uh, the uh, political actors. So, uh, in this uh, present context, what do you think uh, is the right, the, how, uh, maybe uh, your perspective of how African politicians can actually uh, uh, go about it to ensure that their uh, political ambitions do not undermine uh, uh, the ambitions or, or the, the, of the state and the people. So let's just try to, to get an, uh, an understanding and see how we can fix the, polit the politics to also have a good governance which will in turn ensure a better positive result awaited by the citizens. Yes, so it, it is quite um, a dilemma that we face from a governance and leadership point of view to expect the leaders to put in place or change of their own accord in the way in which they exercise leadership for the benefit of many. It is rather that equilibrium that we want. The actors in leadership, the political leaders, should be held accountable by a force that is outside of them. That means the institutions must be in place. That means the electorate in each country must be in place to actually hold the politicians to behave the way that they should. Otherwise, it is not possible for us, or it's rather uh, not really fair, or rather it's not uh, logical for us to expect the leaders to self-correct or to change of their own accord when they are doing well from an individual gain point of view. Currently, those leaders who allow for the lapse in governance, they are enjoying what they are doing, they are gaining at an individual level. It is the other two parties to it. The institutions that have been set up and the leaders in those institutions uh, the accountability institutions, and then also the general population, making sure that they hold everybody accountable. That's how it's going to work. Everybody is accountable. If nobody is above the law, of course, uh, uh, it will go a long way uh, to solving the many problems, uh, especially corruption, transparency, accountability across Africa. And of course, there is need to... Uh, uh, chart or define of good policies and also to ensure the implementation of these policies that will go a long way uh, to change the trajectory uh, of uh, the continent Africa, to take Africa to where it belongs. Like uh, uh, it has been mentioned in the program, Africa has the market. Africa shouldn't be just the source of raw material. So if governments can make the environment favorable, conducive for, of course, for business to thrive across Africa, and of course, especially yeah, as the African continent of free trade area is already functional, then it will go a long way to solving the economic problems of the country, of the continent, and of course, in turn, solving the political and the social problems faced by the African continent as well. Uh, thanking the two gentlemen uh, for the great insight. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Good News Kadogan, uh, reiterating that you are a Pan-African leadership uh, coach. Thank you for your time and thank you for the great insight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clarice, and thanks you to your listeners.
Thank you too. Wishing you a, a great day, a great day out there in uh, South Africa. Also thanking uh, Mr. Francis uh, Umendiego, who joined in his capacity as the governance policy researcher and a project management expert. He joined us from uh, Nigeria. Thank you for the great insight on our topic for discussion this day, which was centered on governance and looking at how Africa uh, government or African government can reshape or redefine their governance system amidst a shift or a drastic, uh, a drastic shift in international politics. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for trusting the Pan-African Television and thank you to the technicians for the smooth run of the program. Keep uh, trusting Afric Media and of course, keep having a wonderful moment in the company of our transmissions. See you some other time. Bye-bye. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous.